Hello, everyone, and welcome to a webinar on what we know about nano EHS risk assessment and risk management. My name is Paul Schulte. I direct the NIOSH Nanotechnology Research Center. And I am pleased to be here with three colleagues. And we have been invited to take stock of what's been happening since the 2011 NNI strategic plan uh, that dealt with nano EHS. And particularly the focus, a focus in that plan was risk assessment and risk management. And you're going to hear today from uh, four speakers, myself and three others, uh, who will help uh, address that issue. Uh, first, a few housekeeping items. This uh, webinar is being recorded and will be available in the public web pages of NNI uh, not too long afterwards, maybe, maybe a couple of weeks. I'm not sure exactly the time, but it will be available. Uh, secondly, uh, questions are welcomed, and we hope uh, that there will be a, a good discussion among the panelists. And we welcome your questions through the Q&A box. The chat uh, function is not available, but the Q&A box will be where we will uh, look for questions and respond to them. This uh, webinar is particularly, I think, important in this day and age as we've now had close to 20 years experience with engineered nanomaterials. And we've had activities from research uh, through risk assessment, through risk management and, and policy. And it's useful that we take stock of where we are and particularly since 2011, when the uh, most recent NNI strategy came about. Uh, we do have a, an exciting panel for you today because this is a telling question. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, nano uh, EHS research strategy of the NNI focused on employing science-based risk analysis and risk management. And indeed, that was done to protect public health and the environment, at the same time fostering the technological advancements uh, that benefits society. Next slide. And as I said, it's been about 20 years since uh, engineer nanomaterials uh, came into commerce. And indeed, the first people uh, who were exposed to engineer nanomaterials were workers. Next slide. And so I'm going to focus mostly today on talking about workers. Workers were exposed all through the life cycle of engineered nanomaterials from research through end of life, and particularly uh, in the manufacturing and incorporation of products. Next slide. And uh, indeed, uh, the uh, 10 most widely used uh, nanomaterials in commerce uh, are shown in this slide. And you can see that uh, many of the ones that uh, you might be familiar with in risk assessments, uh, titanium dioxide, carbon nanotubes, uh, silver nanoparticles uh, are in the top 10 as reported by WHO. Next slide. Now, as we develop uh, a effort to uh, look at risk assessment, we have, uh, go to the next slide for a second. Uh, there, there, those two were out of order. This is a slide that shows the NNI uh, 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 risk assessment framework, which builds off the NRC framework from 1983, which is essentially what's characterized risk assessment in occupational and environmental uh, health uh, particularly dealing with chemicals. And it had four elements, hazard identification, exposure assessment, dose response assessment, and risk characterization. Now, if you go back, uh, Kristen, to the previous slide, uh, in the occupational field, we follow that same pattern more or less with one general exception. In the risk assessment per se, uh, 
exposure assessment is not utilized. Uh, exposure assessment is clearly uh, important in hazard identification, uh, but it's not an element in risk assessment. Exposure assessment is also important in risk management, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about that later. Uh, next two slides, go, go to. There you go. So in occupational risk assessment, as I said, we follow the NRC and the NNI process, uh, but we don't use exposure assessment because in the occupational risk assessment area, uh, the effort is to estimate uh, health risks of workers from a particular toxicant or toxicants at various levels of exposure. In the environmental field, uh, risk assessment is used to project the burden of risk over a population. Here we're looking for a level of exposure uh, that will be safe and will be useful then in risk management. Next slide, please. You could qualitatively think about risk assessment in terms of three major eras. Uh, early after the uh, entry of engineered nanomaterials into commerce, uh, there was a risk assessment was essentially done on a precautionary approach, maybe benchmarking with other uh, uh, substances in the environment in commerce and, and going from there. Then as more data became uh, available, more particularly more animal studies, quantitative risk assessment and modeling uh, occurred. And finally, we're at a point now where uh, it was always known that a risk assessment and research would not be able to be conducted for each individual nanomaterial in commerce. There's a myriad of them. Consequently, grouping and categorical approaches were necessary, and that's the era we're going into now. Next slide, please. So what have we learned in these areas? Let's take stock. Uh, for hazard assessment, uh, we've learned that there can be biologic response uh, that is similar at the nanoscale as well as at the microscale, particularly in terms of lung inflammation and fibrosis, though the potency and the time of onset may differ. Uh, with in exposure to engineered nanomaterials, some targets may be unique because those, the nanomaterials can get into cells and organelles. And then uh, also the biologic response and mode of action can depend on particle properties. What we don't know well enough is how to discern the influence of specific particle properties from other factors such as uh, experimental design or lab to lab variability. Next slide, please. Uh, in terms of the hazard of uh, uh, engineered nanomaterials, we can look at the top 10 uh, materials in commerce as shown on this slide, and we can look at what's uh, been found in epidemiologic studies and animal studies. For the most part, in the epidemiologic studies, there is very little uh, information and, and hardly anything in terms of uh, positive uh, uh, epidemiologic studies that link exposure to the development of, uh, of frank disease. Uh, for the most part, that's because most of the studies have been cross-sectional. And what you really need, if you're going to look for a causal relationship between an exposure and effect, is a longitudinal study. Consequently, uh, there haven't been many of those, uh, partly because the time that nanomaterials have been in commerce is only 20 years. And, uh, the actual mobilization of epidemiologic studies is more likely uh, a function of the last 10 years. Uh, there have been some cross-sectional studies and they have found a variety of adverse effects, mostly biologic markers indication of, uh, of uh, reactive oxygen uh, species uh, and uh, oxidative stress. And so you can see uh, a lot of uh, positive uh, uh, findings there. And then uh, you can clearly see in the, in the realm of animal studies that there have been a lot of uh, findings, uh, not only frank cancers, uh, uh, pulmonary cancers, uh, and non-malignant uh, respiratory effects, uh, but a variety of other kinds of, of health hazards. 
And the question will be uh, the significance of the animal data uh, uh, with regard vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the human data. And I'll talk a bit about that a little later. Next slide, please. Just to sum what that uh, slide just showed, uh, this is uh, the comments of Fishman, that essentially that frank adverse health effects associated with engineered nanomaterials have not been reported in humans. However, there is accumulating evidence from animal studies that exposure to some nanomaterials is harmful. Next slide. So what have we learned in exposure assessment? I said we don't use exposure assessment directly in, uh, in occupational risk assessments, but we do in terms of risk management and exposure assessment is critical in epidemiologic st studies. And this may seem like a simple finding, but we've learned in the uh, last 10 years, if not over the 20 years, that we can measure engineered nanomaterials in the workplace. This was a question that was up for consideration in the early days. Uh, and uh, we, can, uh, we can and have developed ways for airborne sampling, sizing, and chemical analysis. We can distinguish ENMs from background particles. And for the most part, the mass metric is still uh, mass per unit volume is still the most practical metric uh, to use. What we don't know is whether that metric is the best metric to predict uh, health consequences. And, uh, and consequently, that's still a, a question that needs examination. Also, we need uh, to develop integrated strategies across mixtures of particle types and sizes. Next slide. Now, what we've learned in the area of uh, dose response assessment is that the, uh, on, on a uh, mass and uh, surface area basis, the potency of engineered nanomaterials appears that it can be greater than for larger scale particles. Uh, again, comp chemical composition is a key predictor. Uh, and potent, but potency can vary widely depending on particle size. Uh, what we don't know is how to predict the effects of combinations of physical chemical properties. And this gets at the issue of uh, uh, when we're starting to look for categorical uh, approaches, uh, we have to think about how we can combine various uh, physical chemical properties. And also, uh, a, uh, from a risk assessment perspective, how to predict chronic effects from short-term in vivo or in vitro data. Next slide, please. Now there's disagreement in the literature and in the field over uh, whether the rat is a useful model for humans with regard to lung cancer. As I said, we haven't been able to uh, conduct many epidemiologic studies thus far. And so essentially there is only animal data to uh, utilize. Next slide. Uh, but the utility of the of rodents to predict human cancer has been demonstrated, I think, quite strongly by uh, the work of Moderley back in, in 1997, who looked at uh, IR carcinogens and identified whether or not there was a, a, uh, an animal, uh, animal data that showed that substances that were animal carcinogens were also IR carcinogens. And indeed, uh, that was shown uh, to be true. Now, there are issues in uh, extrapolating from uh, rodents to humans. Uh, and I'll talk a bit about that in a moment. Next slide. Uh, and one of those issues is that uh, there is concern that uh, in rodents, we see particle overload uh, in other words, doses that may be um, uh, larger than what would occur in uh, uh, various uh, human situations, work situations. But overload can be addressed by using dosimetry methods that account for a higher order kinetics to estimate uh, retained particle dose. Uh, and so while it's a concern, it isn't necessarily uh, an, over, an eliminating factor for using uh, rodent data. Next, please. 
And so we can extrapolate from uh, rodents to humans using uh, dose imagery models and the determination of um, equivalent doses uh, by making adjustments for differences in particle surface area. Next slide. And this is an example of the approach that uh, uh, builds off the early work of Oberdorster and, uh, and then the work of Eileen Kempel and colleagues at NIOSH for extrapolating uh, from rodents to humans uh, by assuming an equal response with an equal uh, dose and finding the equivalent tissue dose. This then leads to the development of uh, uh, an assessment where you can uh, then uh, draw a line uh, in terms of an exposure, uh, recommended exposure limit. And I'll get to that in a bit. Next slide, please. In terms of risk characterization, then, when we try to put all this together, uh, We've learned that workers, uh, first of all, that the, the workers can be exposed in many different industries and applications. I showed you the, uh, the life cycle. Uh, they, that ENMs can be grouped by hazard and potency for certain effects. And indeed, this may form the basis for a categorical uh, approach or a, a grouping approach. Uh, what we don't know well yet is how to assign with confidence the hazard group for a new ENM or how to characterize hazard from long-term exposures. Uh, and uh, that indeed gets back to the question of the need for epidemiologic studies. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we do quantitative risk assessment then, not just because we want to know the risks, but because we want to do something about it to protect people, in this case, to protect workers and set uh, what are known as occupational exposure limits or OELs. Next slide, please. There is no generally uh, accepted definition of an OEL, but it's essentially a level of uh, usually airborne exposure to an agent beyond which an unacceptable health risks might occur. So it's where you draw the line uh, in terms of exposures and in terms of risk management to keep workers safe. Next slide. Uh, you can utilize uh, quantitative risk assessment uh, to lead to an exposure limit if you have adequate data. When you don't have adequate data, when it's suggestive or minimal, then uh, more qualitative approaches or analog type approaches uh, are useful and you end up with more uh, hazard uh, banding, control banding, binning of approaches. Next slide. In terms of risk management, we know that we can control engineered nanomaterials with the same technologies that have been used for a long time in controlling fine dusts and powders. So uh, a, risk of, a risk management framework uh, can be a part of a, a company's uh, hazard management program. Uh, specifically, though, for engineered nanomaterials, since we're still learning a lot about their potency and their hazard characteristics, a dedicated nanomaterial risk management program that follows the hierarchy of controls is what's been recommended. Next slide, please. So where do we go from here? Uh, we need more data. That's the uh, essence of the first two uh, bullets. Uh, we need data-based uh, development. Uh, too few dose groups have been studied in the, where, where there have been studies, animal studies. Uh, only a subset of ENMs have been studied. We need to study many more, and we need to uh, essentially work to uh, uh, construct and be creative in thinking of categorical and grouping approaches. We'll never be able to study each and every nanomaterial in commerce. Two other things are critically important. One is uh, there's been a lot of uh, authoritative guidance about how to control engineered nanomaterials. And uh, it was said at the beginning of the era, uh, let's not make the same mistakes with this technology that were made with other technologies. And so uh, people in the field, employers, workers, uh, agencies, uh, issued lots of authoritative guidance. We need to know the extent to which that guidance is being adhered to, and if there are any issues in adherence. And then finally, 
uh, the reality check is whether people are getting sick. And so we need to conduct more epidemiologic studies to assess uh, the health of people who have been exposed under the controlled conditions that have been promoted. And with that, I'll take a break. Uh, next, next slide, please. And thank you. And uh, I'll uh, get ready to uh, turn it over to the next speaker. So you can take those slides down. And I want to introduce our next speaker. It's Dr. Mary Schubauer Berrigan. Mary is the Deputy Director of Evidence Synthesis and uh, Classification Branch at the International Agency for Research on Cancer, or IARC, where she leads work to evaluate the causes of human cancer. From 1999 to 2018, she worked at the U.S. National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH. Mary's area of expertise is in occupational epidemiology, and she's conducted extensive epidemiologic research on health effects of low-dose ionizing radiation, radon, beryllium, and carbon nanotubes. So it's a real pleasure to uh, turn the floor over to Mary. Well, thank you so much, Paul, for that really kind introduction and for your great set of slides that oriented us to the, the issues that we face. Hopefully you can see my slides being presented now. Do let me know if there's any problems with it. I'm going to reflect a little bit on some of the aspects that Paul touched on, in particular with respect to hazard identification in the risk assessment framework. And in that context, I'll be talking a lot about exposure assessment and epidemiologic health studies and, and where we are right now. And because I like to, you know, since my involvement in, in the engineered nanomaterial uh, world for the last 10 years or so, I've, I've liked to really ground thinking in the materials themselves. So nanotechnology is technology that involves use and manipulation of nanomaterials. So let's never forget that these are, these are indeed materials and, and uh, particles or fibers that are actually being handled or, or to which exposure may occur. So in these images here, um, you'll see some references, which I'll make later to field work that we've done when I was at NIOSH related to carbon nanotube exposure. So I'll be framing much of this first part of my talk on the health concerns and then findings for carbon nanotubes and carbon nanofibers, or CNT and F. And the reason is that I think they emerged more than 10 years ago, probably 15 years ago, or if not even more, as one of the leading concerns about toxicological and health hazard because of their unique shape and size. So the concerns were about the pulmonary effects, including pulmonary fibrosis, potential penetration of the pleura, leading to mitotic disruption, um, possibly mesothelioma or lung tumor promotion. But in addition, there was also concern from the um, analogous air pollution epidemiological literature about cardiovascular effects that might be seen, not just with carbon nanotubes, but with other nano engineered nanomaterials. This could be caused by a cascade of systemic effects following a pulmonary exposure, including decreased heart rate variability, arteriovasal constriction, increased blood pressure, and higher plasma viscosity. So do keep in mind that the concerns about health effects extend beyond simply um, direct effects on the site of, of exposure. And many of these are thought to be mediated, as I mentioned, through the initiation of an inflammatory cascade. So those were the concerns at the outset. And just to cut to the chase, I'll say here that still we, we have to say, as Paul already alluded to, that the health effects, the direct evidence for health effects from exposure to engineered nanomaterials, including carbon nanotubes and nanofibers, are still uncertain. Um, the direct effect, evidence of effects within occupationally exposed populations is still relatively limited. And this is due primarily to a couple factors, the small workforce size, but also the very short latency, particularly for diseases that may have long latency, such as cancer. However, in the last 10 years, there have been quite a number of studies, as, as Paul mentioned, cross-sectional mostly in nature, um, among workers handling carbon nanotubes, nanofibers in particular. And as I'll show later, several of these studies have found that there are circulating biomarkers of early effect that may be associated with CMT and F exposure. 
So I'll be talking a little bit about some studies that I initiated with my colleagues at NIOSH and um, describing sort of the framework that we used. As Paul mentioned, exposure assessment is a critical component of hazard identification, which is the kind of research that we're describing here. Um, the component on exposure assessment was led by my colleague, Matthew Dom at NIOSH, and it consisted of a pretty wide range of, of measure, measures and metrics to attempt to measure the, the exposure because we, we, as Paul said, we're not sure which, which aspects of exposure are most relevant. So we focused on a lot of effort related to personal breathing zone sampling in two different size fractions, looking at elemental carbon analysis, but also electron microscopy to identify counts of the fibers themselves whereas elemental carbon was a mass-based approach. In addition, we tried to look for other evidence of exposure, including dermal sampling to identify carbon nanotubes and detection of CNT in induced sputum among exposed workers. Simultaneously, we worked with our colleagues in uh, the, the laboratories of NIOSH that are in Morgantown, West Virginia. And this effort was led by Aaron Erdley. And it consisted of a lot of in vivo exposure uh, testing of the materials that workers we were encountering were actually using. So no longer constricting the testing to just Mitsui 7 or these standard uh, nanomaterials, but really focusing on the types of materials that workers are, are experiencing. So in addition to in vivo exposure studies, there was also potency testing and in vitro screening. And most of these studies for these two domains have, have been published in the literature. At the same time, we designed several epidemiologic uh, studies, including cross-sectional studies that aimed to evaluate what the biologically most relevant exposure metric might be. In addition, we used information from the toxicology assays to identify biomarkers that might be usefully measured in workers. So trying to draw parallels between the animal data, the toxicological data, and the human data. So we designed a cross-sectional study that included metrics of clinical function, including in lung, heart, and blood, and also focused on circulating biomarkers in the blood, looking at biomarkers of inflammation, of oxidative stress, and of endothelial response. We also um, conducted a rather novel study, I think, about using biomarkers of functional immune response. And this was uh, published about a year and a half ago. So it was probably the most recent publication directly from this part of the study. Now my former colleagues at NIOSH are engaged in development of an exposure registry, which could be the platform for a future prospective cohort study. So with that framework in mind, I'll talk a little bit about the results and put them in, in the context of what other research groups have found for carbon nanotubes. So first, and very importantly, to look a little bit at the exposure, um, elemental carbon mass measurements uh, were one of the most useful metrics of exposure because they're fairly easily measurable. And we can, if we, as Paul mentioned, we have ways of, of um, deducing what the occupational exposure is as compared to background exposure. And what we found in these studies is that relatively few workers were being exposed above the uh, recommended exposure limit, which NIOSH had promulgated at around the time we were starting these studies. So as you can see, only 7% of the respirable size fraction exposures were above this rel. And you see here a distribution uh, showing the respirable elemental carbon mass concentration and the inhalable in white. Um, now the inhalable concentration was, as you would predict, higher than the respirable elemental carbon concentration. And yet we don't have a rel for inhalable size fraction. So all we can say is what proportion were above one microgram per cubic meter. And of course it was a much higher percentage, almost 30% of um, samples were, front, were above that level. We also, as I mentioned, looked at structure counting using uh, transmission electron microscopy. And here again, we don't have any standards or recommended exposure limits. And so one way of looking at this is to compare it to the OSHA is best as permissible exposure limit if we're concerned about fibers as individual fibers. And using that metric, we see that there were 21% of the samples that were above that uh, appell for asbestos. In addition, the dermal studies were very interesting. 
um, we found that there was extensive evidence of dermal exposure. 70% um, of the wrist samples and 63% of the hand samples, including hand samples underneath the gloves that were being worn, were positive. Um, the ex evidence about exposure from sputum was, was a far lower percentage, not just under 20% of workers had some evidence of carbon nanotube presence in, in induced sputum. But this does demonstrate that workers are being exposed and, and at, at, through routes that, that one might be concerned about. So Paul and colleagues, Paul Schulte and colleagues, did a very nice paper a couple of years ago summarizing, summarizing what was then known from these cross-sectional studies. And at the time, we had two studies published from our US carbon nanotube worker study. Here we see just a brief description of the, the study itself. Um, we were focused on multi-wall, single wall, and carbon nanofibers. Uh, we had 12 facilities and 108 participants. We were focusing on primary, secondary, and manufacturers of, uh, at both scales, um, but we were, we were studying workers across the country. Most of the other studies that were done were done in single facilities with generally smaller numbers of workers. However, as you'll see soon, some of them had much higher exposure levels than were seen in the US studies. So for comparison, um, the amounts used per day uh, varied quite a bit in the US study and were, I would say, on average, probably higher per facility for the Russian, Korean, and Dutch studies. And here we see that not every study measured the same aspects of exposure, which is an important consideration. But where measurements were taken, there were, I would say, comparable inhalable elemental carbon measurements made. In the Russian study, which looked at both as we did, there, there were higher exposures uh, for both respirable and inhalable elemental carbon. So the Dutch study found that 67% of the samples were over the NIOSH recommended exposure limit in the production facility. So they had a, a skewed exposure in, in one direction, whereas in the US, we found only 7%. So our exposures in the US population probably had very long tails to the right, whereas the Dutch study had the opposite finding. Now, what about the biomarker findings? Um, we found that in a study published by John Beard and, and, and us, we found some biomarkers that were significantly correlated with CNT exposure after adjusting for confounding variables, uh, which were age, sex, race, and ethnicity, education, and a cardiovascular health metric score. We didn't find smoking to be really a confounder in these studies, which is interesting. But in any case, we found that there were quite clear positive relations between uh, CNT exposure and blood biomarkers of inflammation, possibly cancer or fibrosis and oxidative stress. The biomarkers were far less likely to be correlated in sputum than they were in blood, which is also interesting. And also we found evidence of several cardiovascular or coagulation biomarkers that were positively correlated with carbon nanotube exposure. This is also, um, reflected here in, in these data in, in this presentation, comparing the findings to, again, these other studies, the Russian, Korean, and Dutch studies. Um, in addition, we're reporting on some of the actual overt health metrics that were made across these studies. We did find some evidence of positive associations, um, particularly for heart rate and a um, evidence of respiratory allergies that was positively associated with CNT exposure. In general, though, most studies either didn't measure these types of, of effects or found no associations. And then the blood biomarkers, the most consistent findings, as Paul mentioned, were in inverse associations with oxidative stress biomarkers and positive associations with some of the inflammatory biomarkers. Since the publication of those studies, we've since published the functional immune response paper and this is a complex, complex presentation, I, re I realized. And unfortunately, the, the scales are inverted. So here, green represents an inverse association on this heat map, whereas red is a positive association. And you can see that we have demographic variables like age, sex, and race presented along the left-hand side of the output, and then carbon nanotube metrics here on the right. And it was very interesting. We saw similar patterns, but particularly for the, uh, the structure count metrics. We saw similar patterns for carbon nanotubes as we saw for age. 
And in fact, we could show that unit increases in TEM structure count concentrations were equivalent to about the effect of about a 10 year increase in age. So it's, it's an interesting way of, of demonstrating potential immunosuppression that, that may be um, detectable using this rather novel assay. Well, turning from these epidemiological studies to hazard identification, my current function, is, as Paul mentioned, is as the head of the monographs program and also its senior epidemiologist. So when I came here three and a half years ago, I was quite interested in delving more into the, the monograph that had been carried out on uh, carbon nanotubes in 2014. Um, so in that monograph volume, it was determined that multi-wall CNT7 that we all know, Mitsui 7, is possibly carcinogenic to humans, which is group 2b. And the basis of this was sufficient evidence for cancer in experimental animals. However, evidence in humans was inadequate. And at that point, there was not strong mechanistic evidence, which would have led to an upgrade potentially for this agent. The other forms of multi-wall carbon nanotubes and single-wall carbon nanotubes were found to be not classifiable as to carcinogenicity. And this is because of the dearth of evidence across all three streams. Now, since then, what's happened? In 2019, just before or a year before the pandemic struck, uh, we convened an advisory group to advise the monographs on um, agents that should be evaluated during the next five-year period. And during that meeting, multi-wall carbon nanotubes were recommended for re-evaluation during this current five-year period with high priority. And this was done, as you can see in the lower part of this graph, uh, the evidence streams contributing to this were new bioassay and mechanistic evidence, which were considered informative enough to warrant re-evaluation for multi-wall carbon nanotubes. So you are all probably aware of the NTP bioassay that uh, Nigel Walker and his colleagues at NTP are carrying out. And so that's an important assay, of course. Um, but in addition, there have been quite a number of new mechanistic studies, including these cross-sectional studies in exposed humans. And this information can be informative for um, mechanistic evaluations in the monographs. I don't have time to go into it, but within the last several years, the organizing principles of the monographs have been revised to focus additional attention on mechanistic evidence, including in exposed humans. So in conclusion, we've seen in the last 10 years, a large number of, of new exposure studies, certainly, but also cross-sectional or short-term follow-up studies. This current focus on occupational exposure, in my opinion, is highly warranted. And carbon nanotubes or engineered nanomaterials are by no means unique because we see this pattern often that workers receive the highest exposures. And uh, these new materials are certainly no, no exception. Toxicology studies have begun to assay engineered nanomaterials that have greater relevance to human exposure. Um, so as Paul mentioned, it's important to understand what patterns are because we must make decisions based on the information that's available. And the extent to which these, these materials can be grouped would be very important to understand. I think it's intriguing to, cons to think about uh, the role of non-engineered nanomaterials in the context of bulk materials like carbon black, which Paul showed to be one of the most important um, en engineered nanomaterials. How can we distinguish the bulk material from the nanomaterial when both are in a large mixture together? So I will close there and thank my colleagues both at NIOSH and also in the IARC monographs program for many, many useful discussions and extensive research research that to undertake. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was a, a marvelous presentation, it really showed us some new information. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Richard Kennedy. Rick is a toxicologist turned uh, risk policy analyst with experience at OSTP, FDA, and CDC, as well as in consulting for government, nonprofit, and industry clients. Uh, in the nano world, he's helped uh, develop science and regulatory policy in OSTP's uh, NEHI working groups, the OECD working parties for nanotechnology and nanomaterials, and across product centers at FDA. He also developed the uh, nano release projects for consumer products and foods, which produced six workshops, 16 publications, and a recent ISO 
uh, technical report and is now reviewing safety level evaluations in a range of nanoscale materials in commerce. So I'll turn the stage over to Rick. Hi, everyone. First of all, Paul, can you hear me okay? Yes, fine. And can you see my screen that I'm sharing? Yes. Thanks very much. So I come to this as a, I guess, a safety assessment technician. First of all, thank you very much for the introduction, Paul. Um, and what I will try to do today is create a discussion framework to talk about whether the EHS strategy has addressed needs and what we might do to address needs in future. I'm going to use um, a health-based guidance value derivation approach, acceptable daily intake, as a way of doing that discussion or fostering that discussion. Um, this approach is used by various regulatory agencies in order to make decisions for threshold-based um, um, tox uh, evaluations. Um, and the question that I want to ask through this evaluation is, did we develop what risk managers actually need to make decisions? Now, I'm not talking in ways that are in any way different from what or um, oppositional to what uh, Paul and Mary have just talked about. However, I am talking about a very specific appli application of what we know about nanomaterials right now to supporting decisions. The comments that I'll you, that I'll draw from, or rather the material that I'll draw from for these comments are the nano release projects um, that you can see if you go to nanorelease.org, uh, the recently released ISO te technical report that Paul just mentioned, a recent uh, Society of Toxicology and FDA colloquium, which I highly recommend looking at, which goes into a lot of the things we talked about, well, that I'll talk about here in greater detail. And then recent reviews, and this is where I come in as a safety assessment technician um, of actual ADI derivations for a range of in, um, ENMs. And then about 30 years of you know, being the old guy looking at ADIs and debating the policy about how to use them and derive them. So first of all, some of the good news. Um, as both Mary and Paul have said uh, in various ways, we've made a lot of great progress in analytical methods, and we generally haven't seen high potency toxicity for ENMs. We also have a greater understanding of where releases of engineered nanomaterials do not occur. So using that kind of information, we can plan safer by design project, our products. Um, and there are recent proposals and proposals for a decade or more that talk about approaches to do risk management for exposures to environmental nanomaterials. Actually applying those approaches to decisions is something that we would need to go into a lot more detail to talk about. So let me talk about some of the remaining difficulty. Focusing our attention on what data we have available to make decisions. If you're trying to develop a health-based guidance value, you basically have studies of uniform, well-dispersed and specific forms of um, um, engineered nanomaterials to, to draw from. The nature of this overall literature base when you're trying to derive these values um, makes it difficult to, to support threshold-based regulatory decisions. And that difficulty is expressed in different ways if you're looking at, at exposure estimation, hazard identification or dose response evaluation, and for different risk management contexts. So first of all, to orient folks a little bit to what I mean about setting an ADI, um, what we do, and this is an example from the ATSDR tox profiles on inorganic mercury, uh, we arrange studies that we identify through literature searches according to different endpoints and according to the doses that they, that they um, report in those studies. We use those studies to find a lowest um, observable adverse effect and then use that study to derive a safety value that we can use for comparison and safety assessment in products. This is just an orientation. Obviously, this is not an nanomaterial, but it helps you understand the process we go through to derive these things. The first thing to think about with regard to exposure estimation, and again, both Paul and Mary mentioned this, is that there's a, a lot of variation um, between exposure studies, what's used in toxicity studies, and what's measured in the exposure media used in those studies. And that variation comes from the basic nature of nanomaterials, and that is that 
There's a variation in primary particle size, morphologies of the materials, aggregation states, which affects their surface characteristics that are expressed, and in surface coatings, and a variety of other things that you might list here. What's also varying across studies and uh, evaluations of media is that potency of the nanomaterial can vary according to concentration, inverse, inversely, unfortunately. It can vary based on the dosing vehicle, so whether it's incorporated in the food, um, uh, in aqueous media, in lipid-based media, and so on. And according to dose preparation, if you use um, ultrasonic methods to disperse the medium, for example. So what that means in terms of exposure and estimation, at least the first thing that I'd like to talk about, is that matching dose to the exposure, dose in, an, in, 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 a, in a toxicity study to an exposure in an environmental medium is complicated. If you add an, an engineered nanomaterial to a product or to, or look for it in environmental media or in a study's dosing medium, um, the addition and the interaction with the medium actually can change the toxicity of the, of the nanomaterial. Furthermore, if you try to measure that nanomaterial in those media, the background interference of uh, measuring it in situ and the transformations that happen during extraction make it difficult to say what the dose was that you actually delivered. What this means in terms of decision support is that we may be uncertain that a particular engineered nanomaterial in an exposure study is comparable enough to the study that we are using to derive a safety decision from the toxicology study. So exposure estimation also comes into play in terms of understanding the doses. So studies that we have to draw from for deriving ADIs rarely do analysis of particle concentration for uh, the engineered nanomaterial that includes composition of the material, aggregation state, surface chemistry, and a variety of other factors. And what's further complicating is that received dose in a toxicity study that we're looking at decreases or can decrease as concentration of the nanomaterial in that medium increases due to ag aggregation. What this means for decision support is that quantitative exposure estimates and dose response curves, the, 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 the trade of toxicologists in deriving these kinds of values are very difficult to compare between studies and that increases the uncertainty that we have so that we either overestimate or underestimate, underestimate toxic effects. And I would say more so than we have for the same issues for chemicals. Moving on from exposure to hazard identification, one of the effects of the database is that we're not quite sure that all effects have been studied. So as mentioned in, by both Paul and, and Mary, again, toxicity studies vary widely in the select, selected morphology, size, surface chemistry, and other characteristics. And the amount of information that's reported in the studies also varies widely. What this means is we're rarely confident that the same engineered nanomaterial form studied in one lab is the one that's studied in the next lab. In fact, it can vary from postdoc to postdoc in the same lab in some cases. Therefore, it's difficult to know if all of the toxicity endpoints have been studied for the most toxic form of the, uh, the engineered nanomaterial. And let me explain a little bit what I mean by that by looking back at this same graph again. But this time we're looking at dioxin, the most potent conjure of dioxin. And I want you to imagine that for this study or these sets of studies on the left-hand side of the screen and for endocrine effects, used perhaps an 80 nanometer particle that had a positive charge. When you're faced with evaluating the literature base, you might say that for studies that are looking at the immunologic effects, they were using a much smaller form. Maybe they're using a five nanometer form and it had a different charge or it had a different adduct uh, set on its surface. What that means is we don't know whether if we had studied, sorry, if we had studied this nanomaterial or this endpoint using a different nanomaterial, if we would have seen lower dose effects. Or conversely, if we had studied a larger material or a different material, we would have seen a different outcome. What this means is we don't know whether we've actually covered the entire range of these materials with a uniform enough test material to understand whether we've identified the most sensitive effects. So let me give you an example of this. So hazard identification in an example that we've, we've actually recently undertaken for a material that's widely used in, in commerce 
we found just 14 studies that were usable for deriving a, a threshold-based uh, value. Of those 14 studies, nine of them didn't report distribution data. So we couldn't really compare whether they had distribution profiles for size for the nanomaterials across those. 13 of those studies were one endpoint exploratory studies, meaning only really one of them covered a broad range of endpoints. The source of materials ranged from different manufacturers to purchased from uh, chemical supply houses. Uh, primary particle size ranged from five to 80 nanometers. The designs of the studies range from five animals per dose group to 40. And I can tell you this 40 dose group was probably the one study that didn't just look at one endpoint, probably an NTP style study. Three deaths to a single dose plus control. So what this means is the literature we have now, at least for this material, and I can tell you it's a material that was, is widely in commerce, but that and that others have assessed in, in quite a, a lot of detail recently. We don't have enough information to understand whether we can confidently prepare um, a threshold-based comparison method to use in evaluating environmental media. Furthermore, because of the variation in the form studied across the literature base, it's hard, even if we can derive an ADI, for a risk manager to say that that ADI applies broadly or to other kinds of uh, nanomaterials that might be used in commerce. So let's go on to risk management context and talk about where it is that um, this literature base informs or doesn't inform risk management as well. Um, during manufacture, as Paul and, and Mary have alluded to, it's easier to measure the, uh, the engineering of nanomaterial um, before you've had problems of binding to surf to matrix in the uh, finished product, surface changes due to transformations in various formulation steps, um, aggregation, and then background um, uh, that gets in the way of analysis. So because of that ease, that relative ease to measuring the engineered nanomaterial, it's easier to relate those measures to available toxicity studies because of lesser concern about comparison across forms. For that reason, and I agree very much with Paul and Mary in this, it's easier or it's functionally more you know, feasible um, to do risk management within occupational uh, settings, particularly for manufacturing stages of that. But if you turn to steps after manufacture, there's a difficulty in comparing the engineered nanomaterial and exposure media to those used in toxicity studies, and it makes it harder to enforce an ADI. What does this mean? So let's, let's turn to a challenge that's currently in front of us that um, I'll go into a little bit of detail, but not much because I don't have that much time. Titanium dioxide. And, and you'll notice I haven't put a little N in front of the TiO2, and I think that may be a message to a fair number of people. Um, food grade titanium dioxide, which is the E171 standard in Europe, has particle sizes that go into the nanoscale. Whether and how much and whether that means it's an engineered animal material by definition has been a, a subject of a lot of discussion. However, recent findings, the reason I'm talking about this particular material right now, implicate oral carcinogenicity for um, E171 or food grade nano, uh, uh, titanium dioxide. As a result of those implications, there was actually a ban to use by the country, by France um, for 2020. And then just this year, the European Food Safety Authority advised through um, a detailed assessment they did that E171 is no longer safe as a food additive. Um, they came to this conclusion, which is truncated, and you can read it in detail if you go to the actual study, of course, um, due to uh, genotoxicity potential and also insufficient data to set an ADI. What does this mean? So why do we care about this? If we're generally not finding high potency toxic effects, why do we care that those findings have occurred for that particular material? First, because there's indication of toxicity that we can't ignore the potential for genotoxic um, carcinogenicity. Second, if we can't draw a safe line for conditions of exposure for that material, 
then we're almost forced into the position, or maybe we are forced into the position of identifying the entire material as a hazard. And that was the response that France took for 2020. But finally, and I think this has perhaps a greater impact, Farina, for engineered nanomaterials that we want to use in commerce, or for materials that are unfortunately called engineered nanomaterials, how do we actually determine whether they're safe if we don't have a database from which to set safe values? So my conclusions, we've made great progress again. I don't wanna discount this in any way at all. Analytical methods, we haven't seen high potency toxicity. So that's a good finding. Actually, it's a very foundational finding. We can make better decisions about safer design and we can generate data for risk management at manufacturing stages. These are huge findings and huge progress since uh, 2003 or four and 2011 when we first started doing these strategies. However, it's unclear, at least to me, how to use the available data and current risk management methods for food and environmental media and lack of decision support for those threshold-based mechanisms, which extend to reference doses, minimal risk levels, tolerable daily intake levels, things that use a threshold-based um, mechanism to help guide decisions. It'll mean that we can't do innovation because we'll be forced into these categorical decisions, perhaps. So what I recommend, and there's actually already methods that have been set out for, for doing these kinds of decisions, applying them in a regulatory uh, context is what I think we need to push for. We need to provide decision methods that regulatory agencies can use for food and environmental media. We actually need to provide those and then fund research that develop data is needed for their use. So that's all I have to say today. Uh, I hope I've stimulated a lot of discussion. And if you have questions, please send me a note. Thanks, Paul. Thanks a lot, Rick. That was quite uh, stimulating indeed. Um, I think we're going to be pressed for time today, folks. So I don't know if we're going to be able to get to many questions, but we'll have the last speaker and then see what's left. It's my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Igor Linkoff, who is a senior scientific and technical manager with the uh, US Army uh, Engineer Research and Development Center and also adjunct professor of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon. Igor is a leader in the field of risk assessment, has published many books and uh, been involved in not only looking at nanotechnology, uh, but in emerging, uh, emerging technologies and developing uh, comprehensive risk assessment and risk management approaches. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Igor. Uh, thank you very much. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. It's not a presentation. Um, Put, there you go. Good. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I like to start with Rick's conclusion because I 100% agree uh, and um, I especially like to focus on decision methods that regulatory agency can use. Um, this is actually uh, how I started in the field back in early 2000, that uh, with Nano we need to have a paradigm shift, uh, shift from tra traditional risk assessment to risk assessment uh, methods and tools that will be working for emerging threats. And um, obviously, NANA was the first point of departure in my personal professional thinking about this issue. But I, I like to highlight even more of this current COVID realities. And I'm really proud that uh, this committee and this work probably resulted in a NANA-enabled vaccine that we all are getting from Pfizer and Moderna. Uh, but um, I feel that uh, COVID shows importance of shifts from risk uh, assessment and management to risk-based decision-making. Uh, that's exactly what Rick uh, uh, brought up. Uh, and I will try to talk a little bit about uh, what is happening now in this shift, uh, especially in Europe uh, towards risk governance. And finally, I will touch a little bit uh, next uh, next uh, uh, paradigm shift that I'm working on now is from risk to resilience. So uh, 
I don't like to spend much time on the problem of risk assessment. It requires a lot of information. And not that we uh, don't have information. As Rick uh, was saying, we don't have information relevant uh, to make uh, decision makers uh, by regulatory agencies confident, right? Or at least as confident as we do for uh, uh, conventional chemicals. Um, and exposure assessment is difficult and effects may be unknown. So uh, again, for Nana is for me like one example of emerging threats. So I was actually teaching in Venice back in 2013 when I developed a few slides that I like to show uh, is basically about emerging threats of that time. Uh, 700 years ago, we had plague. Uh, and uh, what happened is that plague arrived to Europe uh, very fast, within 20 years, you know, think about uh, transportation and communication modalities 700 years ago. But then within um, a couple of decades, population of Europe, two thirds was dead, right? So uh, that was a major pandemics of the past. Uh, what we have now, it's not nothing even comparable. But uh, what it was, I was thinking, uh, if I'm risk assessor back then in Venice 700 years ago, how I can use existing knowledge uh, that we had at that point to really help people. Well, uh, what we did, uh, the threat, uh, we believe, or people believe back then that it's coming from God. How you manage it? You just uh, build beautiful churches and you pray. Uh, from point of view of medical field, they saw skin deformation. And what they did, they apply different metals. Um, what is not obvious for me at that point uh, is that uh, Venetians really believe the threats vector is actually vampires. They distributed disease. So how do you manage vampires? Well, uh, they thought that if you put brick in mouths of dead people, they will not be able to chew their way out of graves. And that's how they try to prevent disease propagation. Obviously, this is a long way to say that a risk assessment and risk management would not work uh, given knowledge in the field we had back then. And little did I know that I would be in the same situation with COVID. Uh, in March 2020, I get a call uh, in the evening, Friday evening, uh, and that uh, it's from Guam, right? So a general who is in charge of all this military installation over there was worried that uh, governor of Guam declared that pandemic is over they had only one case and you can see a curve there. So she refused to have any uh, preparation for pandemics. And the general was quite worried because Guam is far away. And if something happens, military needs to be ready. They cannot uh, deliver everything overnight, right? So, and by the way, uh, we had to provide answer on Monday. You don't dispute with generals in my world. So what we've done, uh, we work all weekend and uh, we try to use data uh, that was available. And believe it or not, at that point in March 2020, we already had CDC different scenarios for COVID modeling and uh, we used them. Army already adopted something. Uh, we, all, we also use data from uh, Wuhan literature. And obviously all this is wrong, right? But we managed to provide crucial uh, decision support. Uh, again, we have not done risk assessment, but we provide decision support to generals and to governor of Guam. Uh, we basically said, no matter what, how you model it, uh, the pandemic is just starting, right? It's just, you know, very little now it will be more in the future. And obviously our model was wrong, right? We were at this point, they had very little uh, initial uh, uh, wave, but then they had much bigger wave uh, in the future. So what is this lesson learned is that risk assessment is not working um, when information is unknown and uncertain. And um, since then we have been uh, uh, providing all data analytics uh, for FEMA and HHS region one, which is six New England state. And we were in this crisis situation till now and um, we, uh, we experienced that all over again. But let me get back to 2004. This is when I started the nanotechnology. Just to give you perspective, this is carbon nanotube. We already heard that this is like most studied nanomaterial. 
back in 2004, we had only 70 or so papers on environmental, legal, social impacts of carbon nanotubes uh, associated with carbon nanotubes and uh, over 10,000 papers on physical side of that. So the field was really new. 70 papers is like nothing. Um, and uh, you can see also on this figure, uh, carbon nanotube uh, was in development for some 20 years at that point. So in 20 years, environmental impact of uh, new materials only start to attract interest, right? So it's very different, for example, from Synbio when this only like two years lack. But no time to talk about Synvaya. But uh, overall, uh, euphoria of the field was such that this is from my presentation in 2005 or so. Uh, we were predicting that 15% uh, of global manufacturing will use nanotechnology, uh, right? Obviously, nothing like that uh, happened even remotely. Although, uh, as I said, nanotechnology is a robust field and we have vaccines for COVID thanks to that. But at that time, uh, EPA uh, convened probably one of the first group of risk assessors to evaluate uh, what they uh, did, nanotechnology white paper. Uh, and I saw in the list of participants, Nigel Walker and Vladimir Muroshov, uh, they were part of this panel. Uh, I was lucky to be engaged as well. And uh, I have a few slides that summarize uh, our work there. And you can see, I don't like to tell, but you can read that more or less what we were saying uh, some 16 years ago is exactly what you heard in presentation, right? Uh, relevance on in vitro uh, assays, we heard that before. Risk assessments through product life cycle. Uh, in vivo characterization of several nanomaterials, you've done it. Kind of structuring uh, and um, making sense of basic properties, right? Uh, we were suggesting a roadmap for that. You will hear more about decision analysis. That was my item there. Uh, prioritizing of uh, research portfolio. So that's all we heard uh, back 16 years ago. And as Rick Kennedy was saying, we're still uh, talking about the same issue. So what uh so how can we govern uncertain technologies and i would argue that no matter how many decades we spend on generating data for now for nano we will uh get more understanding but still uh, confidence of decision makers will not be comparable to what you get with chemical assessment so that's again in early days of a nano uh technology, I can win this conference, NATO workshop on nanomaterial risk and benefit. And this is slide that we used there. So if technology is emerging, uh, data will be lagging behind and regulatory uh, ability of regulators to analyze this data will be further lagging behind. So you have uh, these increasing gaps for emerging technologies. And no matter how sophisticated risk assessment becomes, the gap will still exist. So uh, at that point, we were uh, proposing risk-based classification system of nanomaterials. This is core of many European projects now. And what, uh, what is happening in Europe, uh, we move from risk assessment to risk governance. And risk governance requires combination of hard law and soft law uh, that should be balanced uh, against uh, um, emergence of the new materials in the field. So I we published this. Uh, I will skip that. But um, so basically, fundamentally, what what's happening in modeling and risk informed decision making is combination of uh, risk based bottom up approaches that go from mechanistic understanding to values of decision makers. And uh, we use it, for example, this is nano grid project. And um, uh, then we have uh, top-down approaches. When you start with decision-maker values and needs, and you try to go from there uh, down to mechanistic modeling and uh, mechanistic data collections. So a uh, combination of those really constitute uh, risk governance. And this is uh, arguments that we are making uh, uh, frequently, and we use it for example, from, for Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, this is our recent paper, and we work with uh, Trey Thomas on, on this. Um, but uh, I really uh, like to say that uh, risk-informed decision-makers require decision analysis as a central piece. 
you need to replace uh, rigor of risk assessment by uh, ability to quantify judgment and values of decision maker to provide uh, metrics of confidence in these decisions. And this is exactly what uh, currently is happening with Risk Governance Council. They're developing some tools to do that. But let me go back to Venice. So obviously they didn't uh, win a battle with plague using risk assessment. So what they did, they actually developed public health system the way we see it now. They uh, break disease propagation networks through protective clause. They send people who are sick to Lazaretta Islands and they introduce quarantine uh, for uh, regional management. So what it does, it's really break a network of disease propagation. And back then we argued that this is resilience is exactly what is needed to deal with emerging threats. And uh, it's true for biosecurity, it's true for COVID, and it requires a transition from a prevention based uh, uh, mentality to the idea that you know, new technology will result in failures. We just need to be able to manage them. And while well, one example, we just published paper on nanotechnology supply chain uh, that underpinning COVID-19 vaccine development, you can see supply chain problems all over and resilience is the key to address those. So I will stop here. We published a lot in uh, these domains. So we'll be glad to uh, provide reprints and answer questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Igor. You really whet my appetite to uh, want to hear a, a long lecture on uh, what you've presented. Well, we have uh, just uh, two official minutes or so left, but uh, the organizers said we can extend it a few minutes longer. So let's look and see what questions we have. Uh, one question was, can any panelists comment on how to consider or evaluate risk assessment to a mixture of various particles at the nanoscale in an occupational setting. For example, a reactor maintenance worker may be exposed to a combination of particles of ENM catalyst and reactive residues. Has anyone done work in this answer in this area? I can start off just by saying yes, NIOSH has experience in distinguishing uh, nanomaterials in those kinds of settings. And I would refer you uh, to, uh, to NIOSH for uh, uh, a more detailed response to that. Anything else anyone wants to add to that? Well, I, I would like to add just from the hazard identification perspective, the, the impact of exposure to mixtures or mixed materials is obviously very important. And it is something that's difficult to do, but it requires the same kind of information, if not more, about exposure and, and exposure quality. So you can, you can look at different facets of exposure and, and types of exposures in your human studies. And we've done some of that to try to understand which whether where the nanomaterials fit in with respect to other hazards that these workers are, are handling, like solvents or non-engineered uh, ultrafine particulates, which can be quite extensive in, in these settings. Okay, yeah, and Paul, I'd just like to add that um, I think mixtures analysis is one of the tools we'll have to use to address nanomaterials because pretty much any nanomaterial powder pile that you look at is a mixture of properties, um, different aggregation states, different surface coating states, and so on. So I think mixtures analysis is one of the tools we'll have to apply uh, to nanomaterial evaluation. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, it's already been perplexing just with regular chemicals, let alone right. engineered nanomaterials. Uh, here's another question. Do these discussions of ENM have implications that extend to poorly soluble, low toxicity uh, particulate classes, PSLTs? I'm not sure, I, Paul, I'm not sure I understand the question exactly, but I think this gets to the point that we're starting to realize that nanomaterial definitions fall outside of our engineered nanomaterial coverage realm. So um, titanium dioxide, whether it is a nanomaterial or not, um, whether we should be looking at small particle evaluations rather than something we define as a nanomaterial evaluation. Um, I think there's a, and, and Mary alluded to this as well, that there's there's not a, a sharp line between um, environmental small particles and engineered nanomaterials. So having right, a, right. A, some sort of flexibility across those boundaries is necessary. 
and I think uh, particle counting is a critical component there to a particle number, right? As well as size. Uh, here's one: Is there any study on release of nanomaterials from industry into the environment through exhaust devices? I don't know. We would get that question often when we would visit sites, and that's not necessarily the domain that that NIOSH undertakes. So I, I'm curious to know whether Igor or Paul or Richard know of studies of, of these, this sort of phenomenon. No, release streams. I, I don't know of studies of release streams. I know of studies for um, public treatment works um, that have looked at what particles are in um, waste streams in that way, but and, and in environmental sampling, but not directly as an outflow from uh, a facility. I guess I have seen some emerging literature just within the last couple of weeks about the destruction via high temperature incineration for some nanomaterials like carbon nanotubes. So I think this is probably an emerging area of research. Yes. Uh, in, in life cycle assessment, they must take that into consideration and uh, they clearly address this one way or another. So, but I, I don't, I don't think that I, at least I have not seen like exactly studies on aerial exhaust releases from exhaust. Uh, we're now uh, over our time. So I'm going to thank all the speakers for very stimulating presentations and thank the audience uh, for their attention and questions. And remember that it, this will be recorded and you'll be able to see it at the NNI site. So with that, I'll say goodbye and take care.